Hello. In the last lecture, I made a deep dive into Lewin's model of change. In today's lecture, I will be focusing on Coulter's eight-step model of leading change. And if Lewin's model was the model that has had the biggest impact in the field of leading change, then Cotus model would be the second most impactful model. It has had uh, thousands of citations in the academic literature, but more than that, this is the model that most practitioners of leadership refer to when they are trying to initiate any major change in their organizations. So as was mentioned in the article that I had shared with you earlier, this was a model that was propounded by John Cotter in 1995 uh, and it was published in the Harvard Business Review. Later on, he published a book on the same topic the following year. I think the book was titled Leading Change. Nonetheless, this is a model that you can gain a lot of insights from. And as I did mention in my previous lecture, it, I would say, builds a lot on Lewin's model of change. So Lewin's model of change essentially had three steps. Here we have eight steps. But if you analyze those eight steps, you will see many of those steps could be clubbed together and uh, then they will essentially become uh, the three-step model that Lewin had talked about. So Cotter's model is very valuable in the sense that it dives deeper into each of those steps that Lewin had talked about. You could uh, probably think of uh, Cotter's model that way. In any case, uh, <clears throat> So uh, Cota, uh, as he was a professor at Harvard, he did have the opportunity to work with many uh, large companies which uh, had initiated change attempts. And this is something that companies often do, right? You know, you would have heard the terms of re-engineering, um, total quality management, you know, cultural change, restructuring and all that stuff. Companies are often trying to bring about major changes in their organization. Right now, for example, we see that happening uh, with Twitter, uh, where after Elon Musk took over, he is essentially, you know, changing the organization in a major way, uh, completely restructuring the organization, the complete ethos of the organization, as well as the way the company um, does its business. Sometimes the change uh, attempts may not be as dramatic, as uh, deep as um, you currently see with Twitter. Nonetheless, uh, change attempts are always happening across organizations. Uh, we see that, in, uh, for example, in the other tech companies too, uh, where, for example, they are, <laughs> they call it right sizing. Um, but... Um, they essentially fire maybe 10% or 20% of the workforce. And uh, then that's a major change in the organization because the people who are left behind, the 80% of the workforce who are left behind, they um, have to be working uh, more to compensate for um, the workers who were there before, which means... Uh, there may be a major transformation in the okay. way sure. business is conducted I mean, and uh, they also have to uh, be dealing with a completely new organizational culture right you know so what Cota finds out in his observation is that he sees that majority of these change attempts by organizations, they tend to fail, majority of them. So only a few succeed uh, in a 
you know, handful of them uh, out of hundreds of change attempts uh, actually succeed. And uh, some succeed in very ma marginal way, but you know, only a few succeed in a major way. So uh, he is trying to understand why is it that only these few companies succeeded in their change attempt? How are uh, those attempts different from uh, all those other attempts made by other leaders that failed. So that's the question that he tries to answer. Um, and he finds out, uh, or rather he proposes, that the organizations or the leaders that succeed in the change attempt are the ones that follow a process of leading change. So leading change is not just some kind of one-time event that you do and then suddenly things change. No, rather it's a elaborate process that leaders have to initiate um, and have to stay with. Uh, and this process goes on for years. And only when you do all those steps correctly and in a very committed fashion, uh, then you see the kind of change that you want in your organizations. So what are those eight steps? The first one that uh, Koto talks about is establishing a sense of urgency. And this first step is the one where majority of the organizations or majority of the leaders falter. In his estimate, uh, more than 50% of the change attempts fail primarily because leaders did not take adequate measures uh, for this first step. So in the business history, you I'm sure are aware of uh, many organizations who literally ignored the um, signs of change in the environment. Xerox, for example, was a market leader in uh, photocopying, right? But it failed to see the kind of uh, transformation that was happening in digital technology. It did not adopt those changes and ultimately failed. Kodak uh, was the you know absolute market leader in photography, uh, but then it did not embrace the digital photography while you know other companies uh, did which then led to its demise we have seen many other such examples blockbuster uh, was the absolute market leader when it came to video rentals but then it you know thought these uh, mail-in model of uh, mailing in cds uh, model will not make as much of a difference to its business plus online streaming these things it just essentially thought that these are uh, not going to take a big portion of the market share. Uh, then what happened? It just went out of business. We saw that with Nokia, which then, uh, for example, uh, was the market leader in, in mobile phones, but it did not make a timely shift uh, for uh, the touchscreen based smartphones or um, borders, mm -hmm. uh, a bookstore that I, I used to love going to. Again, they did not embrace uh, the shift for online book sales, which Amazon did, uh, or the um, advent of ebooks. So what happened is that these organizations perished because of that. So as a leader, it is your responsibility to be able to scan the environment and see, notice what all changes are happening and adapt accordingly. Uh, and you need to communicate the sense of urgency to your people, to the managers in the organization about how and why, if you do not change, your business is not going to stay for too long, how it would lead to uh, the organization collapsing, you're you essentially going out of business. 
So there are, you can realize there are two things happening here. First of all, you need to be aware of the need to change, right? These examples that I shared with you, uh, they did not, they were not even aware of the need for change. That's the reason they did not even make an attempt to change. So to establish the urgency for change, you have to be aware of uh, the need to change. Sometimes uh, the awareness needs to be there about the changes that is happening in the environment. Sometimes you need to be aware of the changes that are happening within the organization. For example, uh, you, know, you are still doing a whole lot of business, but your margins are declining over the years. That can be a huge negative sign. But if you uh, do not pay attention to that and try to figure out why that's happening, then you will be in for a major shock when your company goes bankrupt or out of business. So that environmental scanning uh, is, is of critical importance. Now, coming to the actual point that Koto talks about establishing that sense of urgency. <clears throat> so people tend to operate in their own comfort zones. So they all have, we all tend to have our own way of doing things. We um, don't like to deviate from our uh, so-called normal, comfortable way of doing things. So when you want people to get motivated to do things a different way, you will have to create a sense of urgency in them that, hey, if you do not change, then this is going to mean doom for uh, us, the entire organization, um, for you as a person, as, a, as an employee, because if the organization does not exist, you, know, um, you will not be able to gain the benefits that you were uh, from the organization. So, so unless you create that sense of urgency, it, you could call it almost like catastroph catastrophizing, right? You know, which uh, technically is a cognitive distortion where people tend to imagine the worst. But um, uh, in here, I'm talking about it more as a uh, strategy, more, more as a way of communicating the urgency of the need to change that if we do not take these necessary steps, then yes, that worst can happen. Uh, this reminds me of um, Andy Grove, who was the CEO of Intel. Um, uh, he had this famous, famous quote. Uh, he used to say, only the paranoid survive. <laughs> that was one of the most famous quotes uh, from Andy Grove. So you have to be a little bit paranoid of uh, the dangers, the, uh, the risks uh, that are always there in your business. Um, you have to be paranoid of competitors taking over you, over your business. Um, and that little bit of paranoia can actually help you as a leader to understand the importance of change yourself and then communicate the urgency of making the necessary change to your uh, stakeholders, right? So um, in a way you could say this is uh, almost like the application of uh, charismatic leadership theory. theory or uh, even to a certain extent, the pseudo transformational leadership theory. We know uh, people like, you know, um, Hitler, for example, um, they engaged in uh, such techniques, catastrophizing, <laughs> where, for instance, you know, they, uh, in case of Hitler, hey, if you guys uh, don't change, 
then uh, the Jews will take over our entire business and you know they will dominate us whatever all those kinds of catastrophizing uh, <clears throat> which then of course uh, made the German population uh, galvanized in the favor of uh, Hitler which of course we know led to the kind of tragedies that it <clears throat> um, that happened in with respect to the Holocaust but the important thing to understand is that you know you can only bring about major change only when people uh, have a little bit of sense of fear of uh, of what they are likely to lose if they do not change Th this also applies at a personal level in fact uh, i can uh, share an example of a friend uh, who uh, had been drinking alcohol for you know almost uh, his entire other life or you know um, yeah from his teenage years and it was starting to have a major impact on his health so we as his friends and you know his wife and his uh, you know, children they uh, were saying uh, prompting him to quit alcohol but you know he somehow did not have the motivation to do that it's not that he did not try but it was the motivation was never strong enough to to uh, uh, quit alcohol permanently uh, so <clears throat> until uh, his health deteriorated so much that the doctor after doing all the analysis said that you know at this rate you have uh, at the most one year uh, so the amount of damage that has happened to your liver and you know all the other organs uh, you at the most have about a year so that came as a huge shock because you know everyone uh, tend we tend to have a false sense of optimism that things are going to be all right that things are not as bad as the seem and this happens across the board that's the reason he was not changing but once he got that kind of ultimatum my friend did change within a week um, he quit alcohol completely and uh, unlike his previous attempts of change where he was faltering over and over again um, after this event he has I would say uh, stuck to not drinking alcohol now for uh, for over over 10 years so it has become a permanent change but you can see this happened because there was that sense of urgency that came in that if he does not change now then it's going to be too late so so that's essentially what we are talking about when we are talking about establishing a sense of urgency and Often business organizations don't do this adequately. I mean, the leaders in business organizations do not do this adequately. Uh, and the ones that do <laughs> do this um, are often these bad, so-called bad pseudo transformational leaders. We see this, as I said, uh, give you examples of Hitler. We see this amongst um, many uh, environment leaders, uh, many rabble rousers you know, who do all this catastrophizing and uh, that's how they uh, galvanize support in their favor. Um, but here we are talking about how to make it use for positive uh, uh, change, of course, here. So, um, and one last point that I would like to mention here. Uh, Coter, uh, in his estimate, says that you know, you need to bring in that sense of urgency in 
at least 75% of your managers. 75% of your managers need to be convinced that uh, they have to change, um, that the organization does need this change. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, not going to work. So, uh, so it is not just having a sense of urgency yourself or amongst your immediate people who report to you, but um, about 75% of the manager in the organization. And when this is not happening, that's when uh, organizations fail in their uh, change attempt. As I uh, said before, 50% of the organizations do not do this first step properly due to which they fail. Anyway, now let's go to the second uh, big point, which is uh, forming a guiding coalition. You may be the CEO of an organization. You may be the president of uh, a country. You may be the most powerful person in the uh, organization. But you cannot do things on your own, right? You need help and support from important stakeholders to uh, accomplish uh, the change that you want to bring about. Without uh, the active support uh, and help and you know, commitment of, imp of these important people, important stakeholders, you will never be able to accomplish uh, what you want to accomplish. And in fact, this is the very basis of leadership, right? Leadership uh, becomes relevant when um, you need other people to get that goal accomplished. You cannot do it only on your own. So when we are talking about building powerful guiding coalition, we are talking about the importance of taking important people, powerful people into your confidence. So <clears throat> you as the CEO may be committed to a particular change, but are everyone else in the organization, especially the important people in the organization, are they also convinced? If they are not convinced, then they are going to create obstacles in your way. They will object to uh, the change attempt that you're making. More than that, uh, you want their active support. So few things are especially important, I said. You want the support from powerful people. So not, let's say, not just a janitor. His support will be good too. His or her support will be great. But just having support from the janitor probably will not be enough to change, to bring about the change that you want in the organization, right? So you want uh, support from key people, people who have power, power in form of titles, right? You know, they, so he's the president, vice president or whatever, you know, um, he's the divisional manager or he's the uh, board of director. So these are the people uh, in, in organizational context who will, if, if, if you get buy-in from them, then getting buy-in from others lower in the rung, people who do not have that power will be easier, right? So people who have legitimate power, uh, you would remember from my lectures in the past about different types of power. So you want support from people who have legitimate power, but not just people who have legitimate power. You also need support from people who have export power. So if you get support from somebody who is perceived to be an expert. Let's say uh, you want to bring about some change and some economics expert also thinks that, yeah, this is going to be great for the organization or this is going to be great for the country. Now more people will come in support of your change attempt, right? You want support from people who have high referent power. So again, you would remember people, uh, what is referent power? It's the power that comes to you from being liked by people for, uh, 
from being respected by people. So uh, if you uh, succeed in, in getting the cooperation, getting the commitment from somebody who is liked a lot, who is respected a lot in the company, then others are much more likely to follow through, right? So, so it is extremely important that you build a, a powerful coalition, a, a powerful group of people who are ready to support you, who are ready to commit themselves to this cause, to this change attempt that you want to bring about. And because of a few reasons, you know, as I have already mentioned, one, you cannot do things alone. How sober power, how much sober power you may have just as an individual, that's never enough, especially when you are trying to bring about major changes. You need the support and um, commitment from and coalition from these important people. But more than that, when you get support from important people, you your, your project gains legitimacy, right? So um, there is a sense of legitimacy now associated with it. So it's not just some wild thought that you had in your mind that you're trying to implement, but uh, other important people who we consider intelligent, whom we consider experts, whom uh, we respect, uh, whom we like, they seem to be in support of uh, your change attempt, which then gives legitimacy to your project attempt. So this is uh, what we call social proof. So social proof is a technical term in, in social psychology, which is um, essentially the tendency of people to rely on other people's opinions and actions to guide their own behavior. So it is uh, related a lot to our tendency to conform, tendency for conformity. So if many people uh, love uh, this particular mouse, uh, and you see a lot of people praising this mouse on social media, on whatever, on uh, the review websites or some you know, famous tech reviewer uh, thinks absolutely great about this mouse. And then I am likely to buy that particular mouse instead of some other type of mouse. Are you getting the point? <clears throat> so that's social proof. Uh, a particular song, if it is uh, liked a lot by other people, then we have a tendency to also start liking that uh, that particular song. So that's social proof. So your project gains that sense of legitimacy through the process of social proof. So in any case, I explained the importance of uh, uh, building uh, this powerful coalition. But how do you do this? So what actions would you need to take? So this is where a political leadership comes into play. This is where networking comes into play. This is where developing those political skills comes into play. And many a times, leadership development programs do not talk about these things. You know, that, that seems to be an, a, a sort of taboo about political leadership, about networking, about power. Uh, these are things that are often considered negative. But you realize uh, you won't be able to succeed in your change attempt, as I said, you know, if you don't have cooperation from important people. So, um, you need to develop these networking skills, these different political uh, skills. You need to develop them, um, have these relationship building skills with important people, key people, so that they come to your support when you uh, need them, okay? The third big step is the importance of creating a vision uh, 
So in the first step, we talked about what's going to happen if we do not change. But in the third step, we are talking about what we want the change to ultimately look like. So we need to provide a clear picture of how our organization, our world is going to be different once we implement the change, right? So we need to have that clarity of vision. Uh, so a, a good vision will provide that sense of clear direction of where we are headed, okay? What exactly is it that we want to actualize, that we want to realize? So, and the vision has to be, not only be clear, it also has to be compelling, right? You know, um, that is, so that is something that has to excite me, that has to inspire me. Um, and at the same time, the vision has to be something that should be realizable. It should be, it should seem possible. You would remember the importance of, of self-efficacy, instrumentality from, you know, different theories that we have discussed before. So unless I think that this is possible, that this is realizable, then I won't be as committed to the change attempt, right, uh, that you are initiating. So, so all these factors have to come into play when you are creating your vision. Um, your um, paper talks about um, quote uh, saying that you know you should be able to communicate your vision within five minutes <laughs> uh, this reminded me of one of the uh, one of my professors actually my immediate advisor in my doctoral uh, program the advice that he had given me so when we researchers tend to do research on any particular topic, we dive so detailed into the topic, we get caught up in the complex models, the statistics, and you know all those complexities that we often tend to forget the big picture. We, we get so engrossed in the uh, complex mathematical models that we forget the big picture. So his advice was this, to me when you know I was a doctoral student at um, IU at, at Kelly School of Business Indiana University so he said that you have to be able to of course talk about your research about your dissertation topic for say up to two hours three hours so you should have that much of knowledge depth on the on your dissertation topic so if you are asked to speak for three hours on the topic you should be able to do that but you should also be able to explain the same topic in a matter of minute he called like the elevator pitch so the time that it takes for your elevator to go from the you know whatever floor that you are in to the bottom floor or whatever so that um, 30 seconds or one minute, you should still be able to explain your dissertation in that short span of time. And not just that, he also said that you should be able to explain your dissertation even to your grandma who ha may not have had any education um, and you should be able to make her understand your dissertation. So. Only when you are being able to do this to all the three constituents, right? The experts whom you either give a two or three hour lecture with all the complexities. Also to your grandma who is not an expert. You are being able to explain your dissertation to her and also to some other important person but within a very short span of time, maybe just a minute. So you can do this varying type of communication only when you yourself have great clarity about the 
research that you are doing, often people do not have the clarity. And that's the reason they fail to communicate their vision. So this is a, a big problem. And I have personally seen this in organizations um, where <laughs> leaders have initiated uh, some change, but then uh, they had no clue about uh, what exactly they were trying to accomplish. So they had no clear vision of what they were trying to accomplish. Uh, this is unfortunately a very common problem. People don't know the difference between a vision and a goal. Uh, but I hope you all are having that clarity Right, you know, I had discussed this in many of my previous classes. So, when we talk about vision, the literal meaning is to be able to see, right? So, when you are the, the, the goal again, uh, I pro probably don't want to be going into too much of detail here because I have discussed this in my previous classes, but briefly, a goal can become a vision. It's the way you communicate it. This actually brings us to the uh, fourth step in the uh, process, which is about not just having a vision, but being able to communicate it. So the goal can be a vision. When does a goal become a vision? When you express it in a way that people can literally see it in their mind. Okay. The, uh, I have a dream speech by Martin Luther King Jr. That's a great example of a powerful vision statement. Uh, I give the example uh, of uh, students having the goal of graduating. Uh, that's a goal. But when they visualize the, you know, walking in the during the graduation ceremony where they are throwing their you know, hats and you know, meeting their uh, parents after the graduation ceremony or their friends after the graduation ceremony. They, um, how their proud parents are embracing them uh, for their achievement uh, and all that stuff. That's the vision. Uh, whereas uh, goal is graduating by so-and-so date, right? So graduating by so-and-so date is a goal. It, it's uh, it, it's not something that you can visualize. Consequently, it does not have that inspirational power. But when you communicate the same goal in a way that people can literally visualize, then it becomes a vision. It becomes extremely powerful because you get literally inspired. Uh, So when it comes to communicating the vision, uh, uh, Kota talked about uh, leaders under communicating the vision by a factor of 10. <laughs> so you know, he is talking probably more in terms of quantity, uh, which I will come to in a bit. But people under communicate the vision by a factor of 10 also on the quality dimension. They, they just thing that passing on a passing on the vision statement, uh, writing a vision statement, um, posting it on walls uh, or uh, sharing it on the annual report is uh, good enough when it comes to communicating the vision. Uh, these are horrible um, examples of communicating the vision. Uh, sometimes you know, vision statements go into pages, which is uh, problematic. So vision statements tend to be precise. Uh, in, in most organizations, people do not <laughs> remember the vision statement, even though it is supposed to be so important uh, in any case. So as I said, vision is about being able to communicate your goals in a way that people can literally visualize it in their minds. Um, they can see that in their mind's eye. And that's what then makes it inspiring. And it is, of course, beyond that. It is not just about 
that you know you would have to include uh, storytelling techniques and other great communication like metaphors um, analogies to be able to communicate that vision in a powerful way that's the reason i love movies you know you can learn a lot uh, from movies um, how to structure a message so that it can be powerful uh, anyway the, if i <laughs> discuss this it's going to take up a lot more time but um, yeah uh, being able to visualize the goals using different storytelling techniques how to structure your message in a way that it's going to have the kind of impact that you want to have on your um, people all those things will come into play so a, a lot of charismatic leadership uh, components come into play here in um, from the transformational leadership theory in the components the inspirational motivation part comes in in a big way here so how you communicate so that you can inspire motivation in your followers but let's also talk about the quantity part um, because this is something that leaders often fail uh, so communicating your vision just once or twice is not enough you have to communicate your vision repeatedly repetition is the key just because you communicated the vision once doesn't mean that it's going to stick in people's head if how so powerfully you did right so so you had to continue to communicate the vision over the entire process of um the change attempt not just like you know because the model seems to say step 1 step 2 step 3 step 4 so step 4 done and then i can quickly switch to step 5 no you know you need to continue to communicate the vision and this then brings up a different challenge so any time you are repeating the vision over and over again uh, it can become less interesting it may cease to be as inspiring as it was the first time when you listened to that uh, vision right so that's where especially the storytelling techniques uh, the structuring part the use of metaphors and all those things come into play so how to keep it interesting and inspiring while repeating the same message that's that's a big factor so a lot of this high communication skills come into play if you uh, want to be able to communicate your vision successfully and the last uh, factor that comes into play is uh, it's communication not just through your words but also through your actions and this is where many leaders fail as well this is something again that um, i have discussed a lot when I have taught you transformational theory of leadership. The one of the components there is idealized influence. And uh, that's my most favorite component in the transformational leadership theory. So it is about walking the talk, not just you know talking. Um, often leaders fail because they do not walk the talk. They speak all nice things, all great things, but their actions uh, belie uh, their words. So there needs to be that consonance between what you say and what you do. Otherwise, of course, you will uh, not succeed in your change attempt. The fifth step is about uh, empowering your followers to take actions, right? Because communication is not enough, right? Just communicating all this big vision is not enough. Ultimately, your change attempt is going to succeed only when people take actions. 
actions ultimately make the difference, right? Unless people take actions, things won't change. But what happens when people start taking actions? They start encountering obstacles. So in the fifth stage, what comes into play is the importance of you removing obstacles out of your followers path. Again, this is something that you should be able to relate to. If you have attended my classes before, that's the path go theory. One of the leader's primary responsibilities is to remove obstacles. And if you do that well, then your followers will continue to stay motivated. They will continue to uh, work hard towards realizing the goals that you have for them. Otherwise, you are just paying lip service, right? You know. So only when you take those adequate steps to removing all the difficulties, the obstacles that come in followers' way, only then you are showing your commitment to your vision as a leader, the vision that you have as a leader, right? Otherwise, it's just again words. And uh, especially the charismatic kind of leaders tend to have big problem here <laughs> because here uh, you almost have to act like a servant leader. You are focused on uh, serving your followers, trying to figure out what their specific needs are, what difficulties they are facing, and then addressing those uh, difficulties, those problems. You have to serve your followers here to be able to do a great job. So all those you know, big visions and communicating those visions will falter, will, you will not succeed unless people take actions, right? And at this stage, the importance of path goal theory or working almost like a servant leader, serving the uh, needs of the employees become critical. And since we are talking about empowering the followers to take action, uh, some of the other models that I have taught you like uh, room your towns, uh, normative decision-making model, those things also become important. So you, you should be able to figure out when to be a little bit more autocratic, when to be more consultative, when to use more group-oriented decision-making. So how much of empowerment to do, to what extent, uh, in what different situations, all those things, all that wisdom has to come into play. Um, and then you will be very successful in uh, this stage. Now, so as your employees, as your followers start taking actions, they, of course, in the previous step, I mentioned that um, they will be encountering obstacles. So, which also means that we need to provide them the opportunities to succeed. So that is the sixth step, which is uh, create those quick wins. Because even if you remove obstacles or all obstacles does not mean that, you know, people are succeeding. So you have to give them the opportunity where they are succeeding. And because when people succeed, they get motivated to continue to work on that line of um, action, that, that task, right? This is essentially the uh, reinforcement theory, right? So when you start winning, you, you, you feel you know, more confident, you, you feel rewarded, you um, then want to 
pursue that line of action you want to pursue that task more you 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 become more committed to that line of action you gain more confidence uh, that this can be done so your self efficacy increases right you know because you are seeing progress so because of that you you become increasingly motivated you become more committed to the cause so the leader then has to provide these opportunities of quick wins so you cannot just have everything long term because i mentioned in the beginning that uh, leading change is a very long term process that goes into years decades uh, but you cannot or or your rather your employees cannot be waiting for years to uh for for that change to fructify they will not have the motivation to continue for years without seeing any tangible benefits from the change attempt that is the reason you have to create this quick short term wins that uh, that is leading to the ultimate change that you want to get realized so you can think of this more in terms of transactional leadership theory again something that i have taught before so what does a transactional leader do the transactional leader simplifies the goals the tasks into sub tasks into sub sub tasks right so when those sub tasks are accomplished then you recognize the follower you appreciate their accomplishment which then gets them motivated to work further work on the next sub sub task so there is the sense of they moving forward it it increases the momentum in the direction of change so if the previous steps focused a lot on the big picture like vision is the big picture here we are going from that big picture to to smaller details and by working on the smaller details you ultimately help in realizing the big picture right so so the importance of transactional leadership come becomes really important but you could also say that you know the importance of positive leadership um is coming into play here too because you are consciously making the attempt to to seek opportunities where you can recognize and appreciate the efforts put by your employees by your followers you are creating these opportunities and you are appreciating them for the accomplishment of these sub tasks which then ultimately creates a positive uh, attitude about the entire change process so that's a culture of positivity uh, that gets created through this process so that's what you need to uh, do in the sixth stage so now we are finally coming to the the almost like the refreezing stage uh, equivalent of the refreezing stage of um, cortos model so the seventh step in cortos model is about consolidating change or building on the change that you have uh, created so far so you have done everything right so far <clears throat> it doesn't mean that you should declare victory that oh this change attempt is done no that's one of the big mistakes according to quota that leaders engage in so while the previous point talked about creating those wins for your followers but you should always remember the big change has still not been accomplished so don't celebrate too soon he says premature victory celebration kills the momentum why does this happen because people become complacent if you think you know or you have won oh i have already won and and so you you become uh, <laughs> complacent like you know ac- the task has been accomplished that's the kind of uh, feeling 
that you experience when actually it hasn't been accomplished. So you, you start easing, your oh, work is done, when that's actually not the case. So that's when people falter. Yeah, so I was, uh, this reminds me, uh, the example that I had given before of my friend uh, who was an alcoholic who quit alcohol, right? Uh, one thing that uh, I think the Alcoholics Anonymous uh, does is that they always call themselves alcoholics, even if they have quit alcohol for 10 years, 12 years, no, whatever, 20 years, right? Because there is always the danger of you falling back. Uh, so you never celebrate, oh, that, you know, uh, I have become completely, I have overcome my addiction to alcohol. You, you don't do that um, because there is always a danger of you slipping and falling back. So I, that's the example that came to mind when uh, we are talking about the premature victory celebration. Okay. And, and again, you, you realize what happens apart from the fact that, you know, premature victory celebration uh, leads to you becoming complacent. Uh, you also lose self-efficacy, right? You know, uh, you you it, it's it's a sign that you failed so earlier you were um, when, when you fail and you know drink alcohol now it has created a data point in you that you have failed so it is uh, you have to rebuild that self-efficacy within yourself that you can uh, quit alcohol again so that's a step that you have to go back to the previous steps of the model to rebuild that self-efficacy. So do not uh, declare victory too soon. Um, and, and, you know, another thing that happens, you tend to lose focus. You uh, and, and I think another big thing is that people will start losing confidence in the leader, right? Uh, when the leader starts celebrating too soon. But then why do leaders... <laughs> start celebrating too soon. I think, you know, this happens uh, a lot for uh, people with narcissistic, you know, tendencies. Um, so this could be seen almost like the opposite of charismatic leadership um, in the sense that you do not hanker after the attention that you get from victory. Uh, so you need to develop the mentality of more like a servant leader here or authentic leadership, right? where you continue to you know, do your work silently and continue to push your followers in the direction um, that they are working in. Um, but don't hanker after that attention, <laughs> um, trying to show the world that you, know, you have won, that you, know, you are victorious. No, your work is never complete. Um, so along with that, you have to create uh, systems in place that you know supports the the new paradigm the new model that you have in place right you have to hire uh, new groups of people um, who are more committed to your new model uh, you have to promote people those people who are committed to the new uh, model of change that you have in place you have to develop people in the direction uh, that they are committed to the new model so whole host of things need to be done by the leader uh, so that the change initiative that you started uh, does not fizzle out after you know some initial improvements that you see in the process the final step in quotas model is institutionalizing the new way of doing things the new approach so that it sticks right so again, similar to refreezing, the last two points are talking a lot about refreezing. So given the example of that uh, Alcoholics uh, Anonymous, where you know they continue to see themselves as alcoholic 
even after two decades of having quit alcohol, right? So there is never a finality about change. Anyone can still falter. So we see that the change effort is complete when in, in organizational context, when the entire culture of the organization has changed, um, when um, there are completely new set of social norms, new set of shared values in the people. And, and this takes years uh, or more appropriately decades. In, in case of a uh, political leadership, it can take generations where people have a completely different uh, way of seeing things, doing things. So these value related changes, these uh, having a completely different norms, different culture, this, this takes a long time. So this is in a way, you know, similar to the previous point, you know, you have to create a lot of systems in place um, and never celebrate victory too soon because realizing the fact that your change attempt is not complete until these major changes in culture, social norms, social values, or the shared values within the organizations have happened. So to, if I paraphrase, People, your, your followers, they will be doing things that you ask them to do, but they may not be doing on their own volition, right? So only when you create committed followers, and I'm talking about affective commitment, not continuance commitment, where in continuance commitment, people do it for you know, certain gains or they have that commitment until they get some benefit. Uh, otherwise, you know, they not so again i don't want to go into the details you should know what continuance commitment is what effective commitment is so in the final step you continue through the change process until all your followers have become authentically committed to the new way of doing things so i'm not talking about authentic leadership here but rather authentic followers you know, people who have become completely, genuinely committed to the new way of doing things. Until then, your change process is not complete. And even then, it, you can falter, which means a, another big step that comes into play is succession planning. So after you retire or after you are not there in the leadership position, will this new way of doing things still continue? So that means you will have to develop people who will continue to carry your legacy forward, right? Succession planning. So this is also uh, like strategic leadership where, where you're thinking long term, way long term beyond immediate benefits of maybe one year, two year or even five years. This is also about some of the things that you learned in the situational theory of leadership, right? Where your followers go through different developmental stages and how do you um, lead them when they are at different developmental stages. So I'm talking, of course, more in terms of the importance of developing people to, to take over leadership positions, including that of yours so that they continue to maintain that same value, uh, that same approach that you brought about. You could also argue that, you know, uh, this also involves individualized consideration where you are focused on, again, developing people, seeing what they need and developing people. In any case, you get the idea. So having the systems in place also having these authentic committed followers who will carry your um, change legacy forward so that your change 
becomes permanent. <laughs> well, well, technically, everything is will change because just because you brought about even if some great change does not does not mean that environment uh, then is conducive to the uh, change that you created. So, but the basic idea is you want the change attempt to be sustainable for as long a period as it is working. So that means you need to have these uh, committed followers or committed followers who become committed uh, leaders. So that's essentially what Cota's model is about. These eight different stages of leading people. Hope uh, you found this lecture insightful and you should be able to incorporate many of these ideas in the development of your own model that you guys are working on. I delve a lot deeper than what, of course, uh, the article talks about. I you would realize made a lot of connections with other different leadership theories and models that you've learned, connected all those ideas with Cota's eight stage model here, which then should give you some greater ideas about how then you can develop your own model. Because just when you're going through a model, you do not understand and appreciate the importance of many of these steps until those steps connect with things that you have learned in the past. So again, hopefully you appreciate this. All the best. <laughs>